So good morning and welcome. Uh, my name is Julia Lendorfer. I am the head of research and migration law at the International Organization for Migration in Austria. And in the name of myself and my team, I would like to extend a warm welcome to this year's Austrian EMN conference on forecasting global migration. Thank you so much for connecting from all over the world. We are extremely pleased to be able to introduce Mr. Peter Wewinger, Director General for Migration in the Austrian Federal Ministry of the Interior, who will offer some word of welcome. Following Mr. Wewinger's opening remarks, it is my pleasure to introduce Mrs. Marian benbaub Fisterer, Head of the Country Office of the International Organization for Migration in Austria. She will kindly walk us through the program of the day and welcome us on behalf of the IOM. After Mr. Wewinger's and Mrs. benbaub Fisterer's brief welcoming remarks, we will have the pleasure to invite Mrs. Liz Collette, a special advisor to the IOM Director General, um, to the virtual podium for her keynote speech. Dear Mr. Webinger, I would kindly pass the word to you now. Um, and I think you need to unmute yourself again. Okay. I'll try again. Um, can you hear me now? No, okay. Yes, we can so hear thank you. Thank you very much for the kind um, introduction and also for the uh, kind invitation. Uh, it's really tricky to organize uh, such a uh, big convention, uh, such a big meeting. And I think it's more than a meeting, it's more a platform where we all interact together, and especially you interact together. Um, this is a lot of work. So thank you, uh, first of all, uh, to uh, your team, also uh, to Bento Fistera, also to the Austrian team, thank you to uh, Tobias. Um, also, when I look to Elise uh, Collett, thank you uh, for joining us. This is really a, a pleasure to see you. Uh, the title forecasting the future of global migration, of course, forecasting is extremely uh, difficult. There is uh, not really a possibility for uh, to predict uh, future scenarios of migration. We all know that. But I think the possibility to have um, uh, the exchange to each other, to also have experts and also have uh, scientists, how to get an approach and possible uh, scenarios and possible developments in migration can help a lot, especially also policymakers. And I think this is also what we see now is not only a digital interface, I think somewhere um, how we communicate, there are a lot of interfaces, but this is also a know-how interface, how we can combine your insights and your world um, and different worlds and how can we bring uh, those different worlds, approaches and views together uh, that we can contribute to a better migration system. Of course, the question is, and I discussed it also a lot with uh, Liz, what is better? Yeah, this is uh, not really a, a precise term. Um, this is a very subjective and volatile thing. What is better? But, but I think better for those who are in the countries of origin, for the migrants, but also uh, for the societies where migrants are leaving, uh, and also host societies. So if we um, manage to contribute to a system that for those three pillars that I described right now, I think then it's better. And um, what we have seen also recently in the last few days, um, better means also less suffering on the route, especially when it comes to flight migration. So less uh, drownings and less uh, dead people in the Mediterranean. I think this is also a very important thing, uh, how we should rethink our policy making when it comes to a better migration system. It's not only about the management, it's also a lot about building a new system. And in those days we've seen um, for, uh, just recently, but also in the upcoming, upcoming months, where we will uh, negotiate and discuss the Asylum and Migration Pact on the EU level, I think uh, everything that is going to be discussed today um, is really essential for um, a, a discussion that, that is reality-linked. 
sometimes we have the impression um, we're discussing different bubbles um, and uh, this is extremely important to, from my point of view to open up those bubbles to combine that and then we get uh, closer uh, to reality to contribute to a, a better, in terms of what I, what I try to describe, a better uh, migratory uh, system. I think this is a, a very important uh, thing. Yeah, that's uh, what I would like to, uh, I wanted to share with you. Thank you for um, giving me the floor and I give the word back to you. Thank you very much uh, for these kind of introductory words. Um, Marian, over to you. Thank you very much, Julia, and thank you, Peter, as well, for your insightful and, as always, thought-provoking words. Um, and also, thank you very much for the excellent cooperation over the years, and particularly within the European Migration Network. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, on behalf of the International Organization for Migration, it's my real pleasure to welcome you all here to Vienna, virtually, and to welcome you to this 2020 Austrian Annual Conference of the European Migration Network. Those of you still unfamiliar with the EMN, or European Migration Network, it is a network that's chaired by the European Commission, DG Home, and it's a network which is very alive and implemented actively in 26 member states of the European Union, as well as in Norway. The European Migration Network provides objectives reliable and timely information on asylum and migration to European policymakers. Um, another thing that the European Migration Network does and that we are all currently part of is to disseminate knowledge about asylum and migration through different ways, including this conference today. Annual Austrian EMN conferences were always joint collaborations between the Austrian Ministry of the Interior and IOM. And this year I'm particularly pleased to also welcome IOM's Global Migration Data Analysis Center in Berlin and the colleagues from Berlin as co-facilitators of this event today. I'd like to say a word of thanks as well, like Peter Rubina did, to the Austrian Ministry of the Interior team, headed by Tobias Molanda, to our colleagues from the IOM Global Migration Data Analysis Center, and in particular, Jeff Fitzgerald, and to Julio Lindorf, who is actually standing right next to me, and to the team that's here in the room in the conference venue in Vienna. It's a shame that you all can't join us in person, but it's great to have you here virtually. Um, I'd like to thank all three teams involved in preparing this um, event for all your hard work and dedication, and in particular for the last minute scramble to completely move it all online and virtually. So thank you very, very much indeed. Um, the topic today, Peter Rubingo already said it is slightly controversial. We're talking about migration forecasting. I think what we can all agree on is that states and other actors around the globe have agreed to work towards well-managed migration governance. I'm gently sidestepping the statue of you, Peter. Um, what we want to have, and here comes better, is a better understanding of the factors shaping migration. And we'd like to make the scope and nature of future development in migration more predictable. More predictability allows us to recognize opportunities and challenges earlier and plan ahead with more foresight and therefore better. And here I go again. We can get back into the better discussion later on, maybe. Um, in other words, migration forecasts, scenarios, and early warning systems can improve our understanding of a global migration phenomenon, both from a research and from a policy perspective. At the same time, we all know, and we do witness at present, all of us, that migration is sensitive to unpredictable and high impact events. COVID-19 has affected global mobility in a number of ways. It's created travel disruptions. We've seen a lot of mobility restrictions. Um, and COVID-19 in the sense of this conference today is challenging the accuracy and current migration predictions and future scenarios. So the aim that we have today is to promote a critical reflection and a differentiated understanding of future migration scenarios and proactive migration policies. As Julia said, I'm going to very briefly walk you through the program of today and briefly 
um, highlight our excellent speakers and the profound expertise that they'll be sharing with us today. And thank you very much to all the speakers in advance for being with us. I'm really pleased to introduce two speakers, two wonderful ladies right at the beginning of the conference who will be setting the scene and laying the foundation of today's further discussions. I'm really pleased to welcome Liz Collette as our keynote speaker. Liz will share IOM's perspective and approaches in migration forecasting and she'll focus on longer term trends and the challenges of a volatile landscape. And then Savannah Vorst will provide us with a comprehensive overview of the main predictive models that are currently in use. She'll be looking at forecasts, scenario studies, and early warning and alert systems and be explaining to us what they actually are and how to use them. We'll then look at three different research projects that will be presented to us by Susanne Melde, André Brugger, and Jakob Biak. Um, and they'll give us a snapshot of migration predictions and how they are applied. We'll then break for about 15 minutes, which hopefully will allow us all to stretch our legs, grab some coffee, and maybe look up from the screen for a few minutes and rest our eyes. Um, and the next session will begin in Vienna time. It's 11.30. Um, whatever time that is uh, from where you're joining. 11.30 Vienna time in any case, we'll start our second session where Rainer Münz, Fabian Saal, Tobias Heidland, and Peter Bindel will identify common elements of future migration trends for Europe and challenges of accurately predicting migration, particularly in view of unexpected events. So I believe that we'll be talking about COVID-19 in that panel, but not only. Um, we'll then go into a one-hour break and reconvene here in the conference at 2 p.m. Vienna time. Rita Behrendt, Teddy Wilkin, Michael Clements, and Matthias Zeiker will speak to us and exchange about the extent to which predictive methods have been used to inform policy decisions and how policy has influenced migration forecasting. Our final session begins at 3.45 Vienna time. Tobias Molanda, Susanna Felka Jensen, who I can see has just joined us, um, Thomas Liebig from the OECD, and Alexander Hierum will explore what migration forecasting will look like in future by examining both technological as well as policy relevant advances. Um, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, please use the opportunity today to engage in the conversation with the experts around the table. Please use the opportunity to add to the conversation and ask questions via the chat function. There will be time for questions and answers and panel discussions during each of the sessions and our facilitators will do their best to channel all of your questions and comments to the respective panelists. I have one final announcement that I'm extremely pleased to share with you and that is that the conference results will be published soon in a special issue of the bi-monthly journal Migration Policy Practice. So please do keep a look out for this publication, which is forthcoming quite soon. I'd like to thank all the speakers of this conference again for your inputs and contributions, not only to today's event, but in particular also the journal, which again is upcoming, which will be probably published soon after the conference. Um, and I'd like to very warmly welcome everybody once more to this annual Austrian EMN conference. It's a pleasure to have you with us, and I wish us all a wonderful, enjoyable, and engaging day. And now I am particularly delighted to welcome and present our keynote speaker to you. I'm never quite sure whether Liz Collette actually needs any kind of an introduction, but she's owed one, so I'll give it to her. Um, it's a pleasure to have you with us, Liz. Liz is now the Special Advisor for Policy and Strategy for IOM's Director General. She joins us today from IOM headquarters in Geneva. Liz has held a number of extremely important positions and from where I'm standing today, she looks like one of the migration policy wizards um, that we have. Um, Liz was amongst other things, the founding director of the Migration Policy Institute Europe and senior advisor to MPI's Transatlantic Council on Migration. She's held a number of other very important posts, including she served as senior policy analyst at the European Policy Center in Brussels and was responsible for the ETC migration program. I could go on and on, but I won't. 
suffice it to say that we're extremely pleased to have you with us today. Thank you very much for joining us. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marianne and Julia, and, and thank you to all the team for inviting me and uh, allowing me to join, and also making me blush before 10 a.m. in the morning with your kind words. Um, you did, however, admit the fact that my career started with an internship at IOM in the research department, so I feel like today I'm coming full circle uh, back to where I started. Um, we are virtual this morning, but I think our discussion will be no less substantive for that, and I think this is an extremely important um, event and discussion to be having today. And I'd also like to thank you for the opportunity to read some of the fascinating papers that have come from this conference, and some of which I, I look forward to passing on to the Director General, who I think is also extremely interested in what capacity we have to think through what the future will hold and what that will mean for IOM. Um, the challenges of forecasting on an issue as complex as migration have really been brought to the fore by the pandemic we are experiencing in 2020. But similarly, it has also brought home the importance of constantly assessing, adjusting, and reconfiguring our understanding of the drivers that lead to migration and how it is managed, understanding the interconnections between those drivers, and to uh, understand how we might prepare uh, for future uh, policy and improve policy to make sure that those we serve are um, well supported. At moments like this, we might feel like we want to give up on the desire to understand the future. But uh, the pandemic has, as I said, not made forecasting defunct. But it's allowed us to be more circumspect, perhaps, and more thoughtful in how we apply it, and critically avoid too much hubris. Um, I'm certainly struck by one of the papers that noted that most predictive efforts by governments and others turn out to be wrong. Um, I can also tell of an anecdote of one particular EU member state whose short-term forecasting on arrivals was so accurate that they were accused of fixing the numbers in the press in advance. So sometimes you can be too good at forecasting as well. But the inherent uncertainty in forecasting means that the process, as much as the outcome, is useful for all of those involved. And at IOM, we've engaged in several forecasting efforts in recent years, and, and one of which you will hear about later today from the Global Migration Data Analysis Center. Um, but I wanted to offer a, a snapshot of how forecasting has influenced our work in the Office of the Director General, both big picture and day to day. Um, in, twen in 2018, in October 2018, in, as the new Director General took office, he requested that the organization invest in a process to develop a five-year strategic vision, setting out IOM's needs in terms of institutional de development, but also critically priority areas of work. Well, to do this, you also need to understand where IOM has come from and where it hopes to go in the future. And IOM is an organization that's experienced enormous change and growth, but also in, in new demands on the work that it does around the world. So in order to do this well, we needed to understand how the landscape of migration might change over the next decade, what implications that might have then for how we invest in our work around, around the world. I don't want to overstate the process we undertook. Some of the modeling and forecasting um, that you will hear about today is far more rigorous and far more scientific. But we took advantage of the fact that IOM just happens to have thousands of migration experts around the world engaged in different, different aspects of the organization's work and from different perspectives. Some of our experts look at a specific issue in an operational context, understanding what works and what does not. Others look at regional and political change. And together, a composite of expertise can be built up that is hard to find elsewhere in the world. So we asked IOM experts at all levels of the organization to offer their assessment of how their region or their area of work might change over the next decade, which factors might be the most important, and what implications this might have for the organization. And at the same time, we convened IOM's then Migration Research Leaders Syndicate, made up of some of the world's leading academics and thinkers, and we asked them the same questions. Thankfully, they came up with the same answers. From this, we drew some broad thoughts about the future and what it might mean for IOM. And again, I don't want to overstate the rigor of this work, but it was useful to create a watercolor picture of what the future might be. Um, it's not a prediction, but rather a smudged shape of the decade to come. It included concerns about the impact of climate change, it included concerns about the changing world of work and what that might mean for labor migrants, 
the use of technology and how that might be used to manage migration, and increasing tension between particular regions and countries where inequalities and desires may not match. And from this, we drew some strategic priorities. For example, the need to build resilience into our policy and programming, to think about how to prepare people for the future that will come, including migrants and would-be migrants. The need to build, build agility into our policies for mobility, to really think through innovative practice and be able to see how innovative practice can help us adapt to fast paced change when it occurs and to be able to use that. And here I'd like to emphasize that IOM is, it often doesn't call itself an innovation organization because it's actually a problem solving organization. But through that problem solving, it finds an enormous amount of innovation in its daily work. And finally, the need to focus on a wide range of partnerships beyond the UN system and beyond member states, including local authorities, regional integration structures, civil society and the private sector, and to draw on a broader base of data and evidence garnered from within IOM as well as outside that can inform our work. Well, of course, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. Just weeks after the finalization of the strategic vision, the first impacts of the pandemic were being felt gradually leading to what we've seen this year is an unprecedented slowdown in global mobility and border closures worldwide and broad impact for people, whether they are on the move or whether they're in one place. I'm personally not disheartened by this. Many of the conclusions we drew from our own mini forecasting still broadly hold, but more importantly, the tools and competences that we use to develop this vision, the thought process and the conversations are now being used again to consider how the pandemic might shape migration. Our immediate concerns are drastically changed. We are concerned for the several million stranded migrants that are in need of support and assistance due to the pandemic. We are assessing with renewed vigor the need to health proof our systems for mobility to ensure the movement of people can be facilitated safely and securely. Some of our long term hopes are being recalibrated from the likelihood that the world will achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030 in the face of global recession, mass unemployment and millions more falling into extreme poverty. But many of our overarching concerns, the impact of climate change and environmental degradation, the importance of legal identity, and the need to redouble efforts to reduce the vulnerabilities of those caught up in smuggling and trafficking of persons, these all remain. Some issues have become more prominent, access to health and other services, the need for consular protection and visa support, the, the need to consider alternatives to detention that might reduce the risk of infection. All of these points have additional salience in these current times, which leads me to my main point and what I hope is, is one of the goals of this meeting. Exact predictions are impossible and further dependence on rigid modeling can lead us to ignore growing trends that fall outside of those models and lead us to ignore new sources of data that might be incorporated. And instead, the value of forecasting is in that constant assessment and reassessment of the future, the skills that are inherent in analyzing the role that different drivers might play in a situation. These are invaluable, and they keep all of those working on migration, from academics to policymakers to practitioners, alive to the possibilities and uncertainties that may lay ahead. And I have to say, as a migration nerd with a fully paid up membership, it also makes this area of work constantly fascinating as well as challenging. There is nothing so smug as a fixed assumption. So listening today to the experts we have gathered, discuss future scenarios, different sources of illuminating data, and means to develop a composite shifting image of the future is itself an invaluable opportunity. And I look forward to hearing many of these presentations as we go through the day and drawing some key points for our own work over the next several years. And thank you once again for the invitation to speak here today and uh, for gathering such an impressive list of participants. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz Collette, for these uh, well-chosen and wise words. What a wonderful way to open the day. Thank you also uh, to the two opening speakers, uh, Mr. Webinger and Ms., uh, Mrs. Benbaub-Pistera.